Kalamboy. And we will then be speaking, hearing more about social entrepreneurship, uh, also linked with, with sustainability, and then we'll have discussion about that afterwards when this is all, all connected. Test. Thank you very much for um, organizing this conference, um, dear Georgina, Beate, and Charlotte. Uh, really, and Lina. <laughs> really um, interesting uh, gathering together. Um, the themes are quite broad from um, European crisis, focusing on the Greek case to uh, what can we establish, what can we succeed with company law and with company corporations and also entrepreneurship has been mentioned this morning. Um, you also mentioned just the social entrepreneurship. And what I like to present is a case study on social entrepreneurship. It's a case study about a Dutch company. Uh, the company is called Dopper. This is a Dopper. So it's a plastic <laughs> water drinking bottle. Um, and I will explain along the way what the case study is about. So what we have seen uh, the last few years is an emergence of social enterprises. I think in the UK there are more than 5,000, in Belgium there are about 1,000, in Greece there are 1,000, in the Netherlands, well, the ones that have registered with the social enterprise and L network organizations are 400. And they are attracting attention. They are attracting attention because their goal is sustainability. Actually, they are... Uh, calling for action, but they do it in the way of a, an enterprise. They do it in the way of business. I will explain later what the call for action is of the Dopper. So sustainability is the goal of these social enterprises, and it could be social sustainability, could also be environmental sustainability. Uh, employment opportunities are also at the core of the discussion, uh, for instance, in Greece and in Finland and in Spain and in Italy. Uh, social enterprises enterprises are seen as um, a new vehicle for fighting um, youth unemployment especially. Um, moreover, they are stimulating social cohesion because many, many social enterprises are in the field of social cohesion and they are providing initiatives, they are providing healthcare for instance, so there are also care initiatives. They are also stimulating innovation and then our perspective is the legal perspective. There's also a lot of attention, uh, especially from the European Commission, but also from scholars like my uh, dear colleague there, a PhD student, uh, Ekaterina Aichiru, uh, who does her PhD on social enterprises and then uh, looking at the legal structures. So there's also a lot of attention from the European Commission and scholars on what are the legal forms for social enterprises. And why is it important? It's important because um, that's what we learned from the theory, that legal, yeah, legal models, legislation can stimulate and support and legitimize new organizational models and governance styles. And besides that, um, a legal model, a legal form for a social enterprise can provide legal certainty for a social entrepreneur. Well, and then my personal goal of um, addressing so much of my research time to social enterprises is that I see it as a pilot case for social companies, for sustainable companies, socially and environmentally sustainable companies. I also want to explain that a little bit further. Um, we did a theoretical preliminary study. We researched um, various legal forms in Europe that are adopted and designed especially for social entrepreneurs. Finland has uh, a form like that, and Italy, and Spain, and Greece, and Belgium, and the UK, and a lot more countries. And we selected three different models, so three legal forms that work in a different way. The first one is the Greek um, social cooperative enterprise, the KINSEP. And that's not by coincidence, because Ekaterina is uh, a Greek citizen. <laughs> So she can read all the Greek literature about it and the Greek legislation, and she can uh, interview Greek uh, social enterprises. The second one is the British Community Interest Company. 
and also that is not coincidentally because it's very interesting to see a social enterprise take the form of a company, so a company form, because social enterprises want to present themselves as companies. And the third one is a different one. It's a label-oriented type. It's the Belgian legal form. It's the Vennootschap met Sociaal Oogmerk. So it's a label that you can stick on all sorts of legal entity forms. Could be a uh, co-op, could be a foundation, could be a company form. And if you fulfill the requirements, then you can stick this label on it and you can present yourself as a social enterprise. So the three forms that we studied in depth showed us that, um, oh no, I forgot something. And then to contrast with countries that have a special form for social enterprises, there's the Netherlands, and the Netherlands does not have a special form. So we are comparing things also with the Netherlands. I'm from the Netherlands. And what we see in the Netherlands is that social enterprises, they take the form of a BV or a foundation, which is traditionally used by charities, or a combination of the two. And the case study um, company indeed uses a combination. So the conclusions of the preliminary study is that we see that in the different countries in the corporate laws where the well, corporate laws or cooperative laws where the social enterprise legal forms are introduced, they have the same characteristics. So we see in all these three um, laws that they all require of the company that it has a social purpose. And you have to write that in your articles of association, that the organization is governed in a participatory way. So stakeholders, especially employees, should be part of the decision-making model. The third characteristic that comes up in all legislations is accountability and transparency going beyond the financial accountability, also including the social impact or social and environmental impact, depending on the social purpose. So you have to report on how well you succeed in fulfilling your social purpose. And then the financial structure is sometimes different because uh, some forms want uh, stimulate that employees become a shareholder. So that's interesting because that's, um, well, so far interesting because this is what we can find in the laws and in the literature about the laws, but how does it work in practice? We decided to organize a follow-up study um, by um, engaging in case studies in the four legislations that we are uh, researching, so Greece, the Netherlands, UK and Belgium. We initiated three case studies in each, in each jurisdiction. And the game was to test one characteristic, and that is governance as a decision-making power of stakeholders and the participatory involvement um, yeah, of the stakeholders. So for each case study, we first had to identify who are the stakeholders and to what extent do they have influence in the decision-making model. And in this paper, um, the research question is, how is the factor governance participatory model embedded in the Dutch social enterprise, in this Dutch social enterprise, so in the corporate documents, articles of association, but also in practice, how does it work? Why governance? Well, governance is a crucial factor because um, the governors are the custodians of the social purpose. If the directors don't follow up to the social purpose, it's not a social enterprise anymore. Um, but at the same time, they have to deal with the multiple interests of the various stakeholders. Like also Georgina explained that directors, a board of directors, either in a social enterprise or in a regular enterprise, they have to deal with all the stakeholders. So there's a, this tension. Um, and the other interesting part of it is that some legal forms stimulate employee participation. Participation in ownership of the company, but also in the decision making and in the, well, they should have a right to information. Okay, I can start now with the case study. <laughs> this is Dopper. Dopper is one of the three case studies in the Netherlands. Why did we choose Dopper? Because it's a, it's a very successful company in the Netherlands. Everybody in the Netherlands, well, not everybody, but many people in the Netherlands know what a Dopper is. They're really visible, they're a role model. When I teach law students or business students and I have this on my desk because I need some water when I'm drink, uh, speaking. Then I usually see that, well, one third of the students also has a dopper. And as you can see, there are different colors. 
So it's a very popular item. Uh, sales are rapidly growing. Uh, there are more than one million sold in the last three years. And they have an international orientation. They want to expand to uh, the US, but also to other European countries. They have been registered as a B Corp, B Corp. So they also fulfill the American standards of B Corp. And they also qualify um, under the cradle to cradle uh, label, which is a six weeks assessment um, uh, exercise, which they successfully completed. So all elements of a dopper can be recycled, are being recycled, and have been recycled. So the social enterprise dopper has as a social purpose to promote tap water by selling bottles, because it's easy to use tap water when you have a bottle. And um, that's the, the business part, the selling bottles, and the social part is to promote tap water. And um, the, game, uh, the goal is to reduce plastic garbage in order to also avoid or prevent or attack the plastic soup in the oceans at this moment. And at the same time, they also want to support drinking water projects elsewhere where people cannot drink tap water in a safe way. So here you can see um, um, people in Nepal, Nepal drinking um, from a newly organized tap. In 2010, they incorporated the BV, the Dopper BV, so limited liability company, because they are an enterprise and they feel like entrepreneurs. But and they did all those um, social purpose um, activities within the BV. But then after three years, they thought it doesn't feel good because people see us as an enterprise, not as a social enterprise. So we also incorporate incorporate a foundation, which is now the Dopper Foundation, and part of the activities are now transferred to the foundation. So the drinking water projects in Nepal are managed by the foundation and also the Water and Waste Academy, which they uh, started. So 5% of the net profits of Dopper BV are being given to the Dopper Foundation and half of this is used for the Water and Waste Academy and half of it is used for drinking water projects in Nepal and they give the money euro by euro to CIMAVI, which is a Dutch NGO that organizes those uh, drink water projects in Nepal, uh, together with Nepalese um, partners. The Water and Waste Academy is, uh, has as a focus to create awareness of the problem of plastic litter and plastic soup, and they organize um, lessons, lectures and workshops at primary schools, high schools uh, and universities, and also for business. So in my corporate social responsibility classes in Utrecht and Nijerode, I've invited the um, founder of this um, social enterprise many times, and then he speaks, to, um, explains his, the concept of his business, but he also addresses the business uh, elements of it. I'm usually focused on the legal elements, but he, more ex he better explains what the challenges are uh, from a business perspective. Well, how did we do the case study? We first, um, looked at the applicable laws in the Netherlands and we studied all the corporate documents, uh, including the employee manuals and other documents that they have, the contracts with Simavi and the foundation. And then we had um, five semi-structured interviews, one with the founder, two with management team people, one with another employee, and two with external stakeholders. One was the Dopper Foundation and the other one was a Simavi uh, project manager. We analyzed that and um, we used Atlas in vivo coding, and then we had a brainstorm. Well, the results are that um, the, because it's a traditional BV form, it's also organized in a traditional form, and there is not much about um, stakeholder engagement in the Articles of Association, but we also found that um, there is a lot of employee involvement in the decision-making uh, model within this company because they have daily meetings, they have weekly meetings, monthly meetings and quarterly meetings with all the employees, sometimes in groups, sometimes uh, in another way, very structured in which all the plans of Dopper are being discussed. So they develop the Dopper concept together and all the initiatives are being welcomed. Um, there are very interesting is that the stakeholder participation part when you buy or when you receive a dopper like this, there's a little tag on it which says 
you are now a Doppler ambassador. We invite you to promote and to share this message of reducing plastic waste. And like you see me being the ambassador of Doppler, this works. So it's interesting that this social enterprise uses its stakeholders to fulfill its mission, to contribute to fulfilling its mission by sharing this awareness and creating this awareness. Um, the future plan is that the employees will also become um, shareholders, so they're working on that. And I have one, two more sheets. One is the, the challenges. Um, it's a very popular company, so when they have a vacancy, there are like, I don't know, 3,000 people applying for the vacancy. So it's difficult, it's a challenge for them to live up to the expectations to really fulfill their social goal, but also uh, remain uh, economic viable. Um, they indicated that it's a problem that there's not a special legal form in the Netherlands because it's, it's difficult. It's a, it creates a lack of identity and uh, administrative hassle to combine these two legal entities, the foundation and the beefy. So they rather have one. And um, yeah, actually I mentioned everything. So very briefly, they're not shareholder. There's a lot of decision-making processes and information, ample support of external stakeholders, and um, they support very much a legal form in the Netherlands. Well, thank you very much. Um, enjoy keeping this up. Thank you very much, Tineke, for that very interesting presentation. It's always interesting to hear your, your combined approach of uh, theoretical analysis and, uh, and the case studies. So the floor is now open for questions for a few minutes before we move on to the last presentation of, uh, of the session. Yes, please, Katharina. Um, I think I introduced myself uh, yeah, in the previous session. So thank you, Tineke. Thank you for addressing me, addressing my research. Actually, the topic of my research is uh, yeah, legislation about social enterprises in Europe. It's more or less a com comparative research. But what I would like to say, yeah, I'm <laughs> sorry, um, is uh, I definitely agree with uh, Georgina before that we definitely need a uh, change in the culture in order to become sustainable. But uh, we definitely need also to see, let's say, the culture, the Greek culture entails solidarity, for example. So this comes, let's say, um, the values of uh, social economy and social entrepreneurship. And so far, uh, this concept hasn't been addressed within, the, within Greece so much, probably because legislation uh, was introduced by a failed government, or probably because it doesn't coincide with, uh, with the policy so far. But uh, I think it is important to bring the discussion about social entrepreneurship within Greece, because it's a field of business, social business, which has been proved successful, especially in other countries, in UK, Finland, Italy, and Spain. And this hasn't been elaborated so much in Greece, so uh, I'm trying to, uh, at least. So I'm happy that uh, I heard about uh, your discussion of uh, gender and equality within a framework of social entrepreneurship. Actually, I, I wish I could also present uh, an aspect I wanted uh, to, but uh, unfortunately I didn't. And uh, yeah, I definitely believe that uh, we need to um, actually promote the discussion further and uh, yeah, of course, not only see how we can uh, probably change the culture of commercial and, and ordinary business, but also how we can introduce new concepts of economy, new concepts of business like this with a different culture within the social, the, the business model itself to probably provide solutions to concrete social problems like unemployment, like youth unemployment, which is tremendous in Greece. So, yeah, that is my comment, <laughs> sorry. 
Okay, there are presentations and then there are comments and then there are in between things from people who would like to present. <laughs> no, that's quite fine. It's very, very good to see your enthusiasm, Katharina. That's great. Uh, Tineke, uh, there wasn't a question, there was a comment. Uh, Georgina has a comment, perhaps also a question, so I thought I'd let her first and then, then you if you want to respond. It's, it's more of a comment and, and um, an appreciation of, of your work, Tineke, because you always uh, bring forward very interesting case studies uh, which shed some light on some topics which sometimes I think I discuss uh, slightly theoretically. So it's very interesting. And one point I can observe from your presentation is the fact that you said how keen people are um, to apply for jobs in these companies. And I think an interesting link to that is that um, for example, in the morning we talked about uh, wages and whether these might be lowered. I'm sure that if, if there's a good corporate culture in the company, the, it's not only the wage which would be the incentive. So this is proof that uh, how you do business doesn't matter only uh, externally, but it does have an impact on, on people wanting to actually work for you. And that doesn't have to do only with, with money, even though there might be profit involved. So I think that was a good point. And that's why I think it's very important to look at case studies of people that are, are seeking for profit, but how they do business makes a completely different uh, world for us to discuss. Yeah, I can in one minute um, add something to this, because since January, I, Katrina and I are working together with PwC in the Netherlands and with the network organization Social Enterprise NL. And we have um, submitted a survey to all the social enterprises in the Netherlands uh, to find out what is special about their business model, so more the economic questions, and also to find out what are their legal models that they use at this moment now, now that there is not a tailor-made tailor legal model, but also what are the challenges and how they, yeah, how they would see it in a perfect world. But um, one of the business, the operating model questions was also about uh, awards and very clearly it came out of this survey that there are so many other things that made people happy for working for these social enterprises than money. So now first we're making two basic articles uh, governing the whole uh, wide scale of answers and then we're going to deep dive on certain issues and one of the issues is the remuneration patterns in social enterprises. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Tineke. Any other brief uh, responses? If not, then uh, we'll move on to, to the last session, last presentation. Or did you want to say something? Yeah. I would just like to say, say something very briefly. What came out of your paper, I feel, Tineke, apart from the fascinating um, organization you're uh, looking into, I feel that um, this session has been about innovation, it really. Um, you know, social enterprises, women, although I, you know, I'm astounded that I'm sitting here in 2015 saying that women are an innovative element to, to um, <laughs> business, but never mind, that's where we are. Um, but what worries me, actually, is that I feel that there's a precariousness in business and economics, and that also came out this morning to me in some of the papers. And in the UK, I think we can confirm that. What we see in the UK are reactions to crises, reactions to um, things that aren't there that we feel should be there all of a sudden. And uh, one example I can offer is now we're worried in the UK because we don't have enough manufacturing. You know, we've, we've spent the last 20, 30 years concentrating on the financial sector and the professions and you know our uh, previous Labour governments talked about education, education, education which on one level is a great thing but it was kind of directed at one, one it was one directional really and so now we're left with people with a country that doesn't have enough skills, there's a push um, towards the STEM subjects but it's not that well directed. Um, there's a push for apprenticeships, again, not that well directed. And what I worry is we're going to now go down that road and neglect all the other things that we have won. And when it comes to things like social enterprises, our legal systems, our economic systems, just doesn't give, it, give them enough support. 
Um, you know, so for example, you know, it took how long to get our company law reform, um, which turned out to be a load of rubbish in the end, frankly. Um, and it still concentrates on the two main kind of corporate form. So these sort of um, community uh, enterprise companies, et cetera, et cetera, they're still seen as outside of the mainstream. And I think we need to find a way of bringing them into the mainstream and making it stick. Very, very good points, Charlotte. And also, not least understanding that there is something fundamentally wrong with the mainstream system. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, and uh, talking about that, we are now going to have a last presentation of this session, which will be then addressing something that we all take for given, that we have the kind of monetary system that we have, that we have money as we know it, that that is something that is as given as... Uh, the grass that uh, grows where it's allowed to grow. So we, we look very excited to hear your, your alternative ideas, Chan, so please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, but I'd like to refer to the case study first to say that what they had informally did in your social enterprise is what I've been suggesting at the presentation in Oslo to be formally done in the corporate constitution, where you give formal legal recognition to the stakeholders, so it's not at the grace and favor of the board. It's written into the charter. And so you don't need new companies act. All you need is somebody to teach people how to design those corporate charters, please, lawyers. Now, I'm the nominal male. It's a great privilege to be here <laughs> with six <laughs> gifted, intelligent <laughs> ladies. Um, and my presentation is a change of uh, pace. And, and basically, the message I've got is that the research question is to stimulate business and depressed economies. How do we do that? The findings is to issue a locally issue a parallel usage for euro that is better fit for purpose in promoting economic activity than the euro, the fiat monopoly funny money, which is distributed by national governments globally. And so the take home message I've got is that Greece has a marvelous opportunity to, to work with the Troika to reform their, mis, mis, to, to analyze how the money is accepted around the world is not fit for purpose for as a medium of exchange because it competes with people because it's a store of value. And you don't want a money that is a medium of exchange to compete with allocating resources that is to be itself to become a store of value. So I'm going to talk about a usage fee money, and it has many names. Some of you might, stamp script is what it was called in the 1930s. Demurrage money, depreciating, rusting money, perishable money, and so on. On reflection, I think usage fee is a, is a uh, clumsy name. And so I've changed my terminology to speed money. It's more positive. And it's why this, where the classical, the fiat money is slow money. They hoard it and store it. And you don't want people to hoard and store a medium of exchange. You want to use it or lose it. And that's the sort of money that I'm going to talk about. Um, how many here have heard about this sort of money, stamp script? How many people in the room have heard about it? One. Only one. <laughs> this, now, so please use a name. If you've got to spread the word and to teach the Troika what they need to do, you've got to find a, a word, a description of this money which has meaning to the masses so you get the population to behind you. So I don't know what word it is. Please give me feedback, send me an email, but I'm going to use speed money. And my ultimate objective is to have Z dollars, which are sustainable energy dollars. S-E-D spells Z. So why do I call it a usage fee money? Because money is a public good. It avoids the cost of bartering. So we use money, you should pay a fee to use it. We don't pay a fee to use it because it's a monopoly of the banks. Most, in most countries, 97% of the money supply is created by the bank deposits. People talk about banks being a deposit takers. Their main business model is deposit makers. Only banks can create deposits, and that's the main source of money. It's always associated with debt, so as I learned this morning from our host here. So we don't want money based on debt. So now this is the most important sl slide, the next one, to get this across to you. In the Great Depression, usage fee money was called stamp script because 
every week you had to put a stamp of, t say, 2%. There's many sorts of this money, many varieties of it, but I'm using this 2% type money. You had to buy a stamp from the people that issued the money. And mostly it was the local government or chamber of commerce that issued this money to promote economic activity and promote their businesses. And at the back of the notes, there are 52 little squares. So during the year, every week, there had to be a new stamp put on the back of the note. So how much revenue does the issuer collect during a year? Two, a 2% stamp every week, 52 weeks. How much does that come to? The sum is up there. 52 by 2%, two is 104, a dollar four. So the people that issued this money raise 104 cents. So they can cancel or redeem the money at the end of 52 weeks and make a 4% profit. Is that counterintuitive? You give away money and make a profit? Are you all with me? Do we all understand that? Because we can't go any further unless you understand that. Well, as soon as you understand that, you realize that anybody could issue this because it's self-financing. And, and you tether it to the euro. But it'd be a speed euro, a much more efficient. And monetary efficiencies depends on how fast it travels. And this money travels very fast because if you hang on to it, you've got to pay a tax. <laughs> you use it or lose it. Now, how can speed money be less costly? I think in the last slide, at the bottom, I said that, uh, yes, consider a business, a medium-sized business, with 200,000 sales per week. So the revenues are 52 by 200,000, which is 10.4 million. And if you had credit cards, if it was a purely a credit card retail business, the cost of the money would be 2% of their turnover. Is this okay? We're still going? And so, if you do it again in euros, the cost of your credit card commissions the, the merchant would pay, your members, Mr. Host, <laughs> would be $204,000. Now, if, you, if they had instead an efficient speed money, what would they do? You'd, let's say they only bank the money once a week. So, and, their, and their sales are $200,000. $200,000 a week, but so the average money they've got at the bank over the week is half that, that's the average, which is 100000 and they've got to pay a 2% cost for using the money. The 2% cost is $2,000 for each week of the year, so the total cost over the year is half. It's half the cost. Than the, uh, and then standard euros. So speed euros halve the cost. And in practice, it would be much more because you wouldn't bank just once a week, you'd bank daily. It would be a fifth, wouldn't it? So the retailers and members of the Chamber of Commerce would love this money. <laughs> so any questions here? Because if you don't have this, we don't want to go any further. Speed money saves money. And you can issue it. I'm read in the press and I've been advised that this, oh, the ECB uh, bank did a uh, report in 2012 of local currencies. And they said they weren't illegal. It's just that the user was at uh, legal risk. And now in Germany, this usage fee money is circulating in many communities in Germany. Anybody could issue this because it's self-financing. Chambers of Commerce, community associations, local government, regional governments, national governments, and even those who are in the Euro. So I'm suggesting the European Commission could issue it, not the ECB, which is the problem. It's, it, it, it manages toxic, <laughs> cancerous money that puts people to debt and enslaves them and colonizes them and you lose sovereignty. Let's go back to history. On the 17th of February, 1933, Congressman Pettingill and Senator Bankhead father of Tehula Bankhead, <laughs> um, put a bill into Congress to issue one trillion dollars of s speed money, a trillion dollars of 1933 money. 
and the stampers be distributed to each state of the United States in proportion to the population. Half of it was to use to pay welfare and pensions. I'm suggesting this is what the Greek government should do, pay welfare and pensions with speed money. Then the euros, the toxic euros, they, they could use to feed back to the people that created them. And the speed money was going to be used to do building infrastructure to create jobs and increase productivity. Who sold the stamps? The US Post Office. Who owned the US Post Office? The government. The government would make $40 billion profit over a year by issuing a trillion dollars, giving away a trillion dollars of speed money. Why go into debt? Why be concerned about not being able to go into the bond market? You don't want the bonds. You want to create your own money. It's called senuage, the profit from <laughs> issuing your own money. It's crazy. You've been in, we've been intellectually colonized that we've got to obey the, uh, the, the tablets handed down by the Troika. It's madness. What happened two weeks later? On March 4th, President Roosevelt was inaugurated. March 6th, he closed all the banks. March 9th, he convenes a joint sitting of both houses of Congress, and Congressman Stiegel, the, of the Stiegel fame, oh, five minutes, uh, reads the first New Deal bill, because there's no time to print it. The bill increases the powers of privately owned Federal Reserve to create money, increase government debt. Bill signed in law the same day. So the other bill, why, wasn't, why did they didn't use the other bill? Because the, it, it, it had bypassed the banking system. It was the government, not the central bank, that was going to issue the money. The government was going to issue the self-financing money. So that's why it didn't get through. Why not use bitcoins? I read that your finance minister is proposing to use bitcoins for Greece. But you can't give them away to pensions, the unemployed or small business. Bitcoins are not tethered to the euro. Bitcoins have volat volatile value, and it takes 10 minutes to validate transaction because you've got to, got to get a majority of Bitcoin holders to confirm. Validation is costly in computer time and energy consumption. Some Bitcoin miners have electricity bills of $150,000 a week. All Bitcoins are tagged and traceable. They've got to be, otherwise they can be duplicated. Now, this Australian Senate inquiry into digital currencies, the Bitcoin people lobbied the government to say, we want all Bitcoin's purses, private purses, registered so we can trace it and make sure that it's not used for money laundering, bribes, frauds, or funding terrorists. The Greek black economy was estimated to be 28% of GDP um, from 1999 to 2007. So what I'm suggesting is that you follow Sweden's example uh, Sweden is eliminating all notes and coins. So you only have swipe cards. So you, you, you'd, if all the swipe cards, so you have a completely digital currency system, you'd be traceable throughout the economy, you'd expose the black economy, raise much more taxes, and there'd be a terrific political unacceptance of that. But it would be acceptable politically if the pensioners and welfare people were given the money, they'd be happy to have it traced as long as it was given to them. So I believe it's a political saleable proposition. Uh, this is the history of speed money. You'll notice the Swiss of Ear, uh, they, uh, that's $2 billion of circulation. A parallel Greek low-cost speed euros, the, the private sector could do it unilaterally. And in England, we formed the Sustainable Money Working Group with the British Chamber of Commerce and I invite the Greek, the Thessaloniki Chamber of Commerce to meet with them to promote the idea of the private sector doing it if the public sector doesn't. And the Director General of the British Chamber of Commerce said, what you're proposing may be Ill illegal in Britain, but the government will change the laws when the crisis came. Let's not wait for crisis, let's do it now. Um, and so you want to get the, I'm suggesting that the Greek should, government should get with the Troika and work with them to, sh to show how they can reform the European monetary system to give sovereignty to local government and to more efficient, more equitable, stable monetary system outlined in my paper. Uh, the Bank of England suggested this year it could drop uh, adopt a digital currency and the Treasury is spending 10 million pounds to research it. A macro stability from a parallel country has been proven by research by Stodder and the topics I've left out, which are in the paper, which you can read, and uh, Betty, the chair or lady, will tell you where you can find it, that uh, 
I've left out 10 reasons why official fiat currencies are not fit for purpose as a medium of exchange, why central banking distorts efficient allocation of resources, how to create a sustainable unit of Z dollars for each bioregion of the planet not subject to volatility and resistant to manipulation, and 25 reasons why Z dollars are better fit for purpose than fiat money as a medium of exchange and vital to allow market forces to distribute the plague of people on the planet in perpetual prosperity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. That was even 14 minutes. So you had one minute left to go. <laughs> but I'll use part of that to tell anybody who's interested, or all who are interested, that uh, Sean's uh, paper is on SSRN, ssrn.com, and then just uh, search for Sean Turnbull. Uh, we are planning a publication with, uh, with some of the papers from the conference, uh, so we're not sure whether we'll make all draft papers uh, available for everybody. That depends, of course, also on the presenters, but, uh, but Chan's uh, draft paper is already on SSRN, so you can study it there, and download it from there and study it. And it will shortly be revised. I'm getting feedback from some uh, alternative currency experts of just fine-tuning my German mm -hmm. translation of stuff. And that's the good thing about SSRN, that it's uh, free to upload and you can update as many times as you want. And it's a great place to post your papers if you haven't already tried that. Okay, so that was uh, SSRN. Uh, now we have some interesting new perspectives on the table here about uh, speed money. Uh, it uh, could, could have sounded like something that uh, was illegal because it was used to pay, to pay for speed. But uh, it's a positive type of, of speed money we're speaking about here. Now this is a, a, quite a foreign topic for many of us, so I don't know how many questions or comments uh, you'll, you'll get on the spur of the moment, but uh, if anybody would like to jump in, then the floor is open for questions and comments. Yes, please go ahead. Can you give him the microphone? Okay, thank you. Uh, there are many cases of uh, speed money around Europe, not only in Germany, in Italy, in Calabria, I think, and in Apulia, and even in some places uh, in Greece, in Pilion, uh, Aragalastin. But the problem is, um, the problem, the main limitation is that they are only locally uh, used. Uh, that means uh, that we cannot have enough data uh, for um, the behavior of society uh, towards this, this type of money, except in the case of the United States in uh, 1933. So uh, monetary theory is always uh, a domain of uh, controversies, and uh, it is uh, a, a domain where uh, we have to be prepared for any kind of surprises. Uh, so Bitcoin, for instance, and other digital forms of, of, uh, of uh, money uh, have emerged in the last years, and they are putting some challenges on the, on the financial system. Um, normally, we see money as uh, a mean, as a medium of exchange, but also a store of value and, and as a facilitator for accounting. So, uh, store of value, I have something uh, to ask myself if the speed money can serve as, the, as this. It probably has the task to, to increase the velocity of, uh, of, of money. And this, uh, it is a concept that is very um, uh, of, uh, often used in, uh, in, ter in uh, periods of uh, great financial distress to increase monetary velocity in order to um, strengthen uh, the, the demand for, for goods and services. But uh, I think it is too much to ask for, for our, uh, a monetary system to, to give uh, any, uh, all solutions for, for a, an economy in distress. Uh, as economist, I very much uh, inclined to believe that uh, the real problems of economy are, are the main uh, source of economic distress, and the financial problems can add a little bit more. Probably can also trigger some uh, some uh, 
uh, economic uh, problems, but they are not this, the main source. If uh, a wrong monetary policy is is a, uh, or a, is a source for for concern, is in case of inflation of high inflation, when we have an abundance of uh, uh, monet money of uh, of monies, and then we can have no 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 uh, control of if we over politicize the issuance of of money, then uh, we can get uh, in very quickly into the field of uh, inflation, overinflation, hyperinflation, how you can, we can describe a phenomenon where uh, money at, at, at least l uh, loses any, any, any uh, reason of existing. Uh, and um, it is always very interesting. I, I, I have uh, considered my f uh, this, this case uh, we have, you have presented. And again, I will <laughs> do it uh, as probably also a mean for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but it is very, very difficult to uh, apply, first of all, to give the people um, uh, the necessary hints to understand the concept. What does it mean to have something in the pocket that is not a store of value, but it is something that um, gives you the incentive to, to, to consume it, to make out of this possible uh, um, um, transfer of, of, uh, of uh, consuming to the, f the future, to make it right now. It's something that uh, anticipates consume and then, uh, then uh, post uh, postpones it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Would you like to respond to that, Sean? Well, I'd like to thank you very much for making that contribution because it really shares with everybody here uh, immediate questions. I mean, you're a professional economist um, and it just shows you the sort of what he was mentioning was he hadn't thought it through like this and, and it's, it's got lost in history, this story. And I was a little bit nervous that you might all be familiar with it and the store saying that money should not be a store of value is very shocking to people because that say that's in the textbooks they say that's what it is, but it conflicts. People invest in money rather than real things. The real problems, as I learned this morning, it's more complicated, very much more complicated. So you, you're saying the same point. It is complicated. There's real things in the economy, but you've got to have the message tick off organizing things as money. Money de defines value, but modern fiat monopoly money, it's not defined in any one or more real things. It's a social construct, so it gives false prices. It misallocates. And if I had time, I would have gone through my critique. I wanted to give a positive presentation of what you didn't know, what you might not know about, rather than critiquing why monopoly funny money, the economists, when it tried, it's got its hamburger, uh, the Mac burger, to analyze currencies. And it also used uh, energy. The store of value is, is really shocking for economists not having that. And what do you do? I've been criticized. And the answer is you'd, you still get investment in mortgages, in bonds, and, but not in money. If you want a medium of exchange, you don't want it to do multitasking. Just do one thing. S stimulate business, stimulate the economy, give it away to your members, proportional, not to their balance sheet or with security, just give it away to, to, in percentage to the number of people they employ. And what they did in Vogel, the little Austrian town, the mayor, uh, as the local council issued it, and the mayor said, I'll take half my wage in the speed money, or stamp script, and half in the Austrian shillings. And they didn't need many. It travelled so fast, five or, five or ten times faster. Irving Fisher, famous economist you'd have heard about, he measured the speed of money and it was about ten times quicker than in depression than the official money, because people put that under the mattresses. I heard that most of Greece, <laughs> Greek people have <laughs> the euros under their mattresses not being used to stimulate the economy. Well, if you adopted a digital money, use it or lose it, it would boost the economy. It would probably increase your GDP by 50% because it make the black, the unreported economy, which is the black economy, visible. And I think it's worth a try. So the l a closing comment on this, it's like when you've got a cancer patient. You're willing to try drugs and prescriptions, which you, when the patient's going to die anyway or go bankrupt, now's the time to be brave and teach the troika. 
you say to the toy girl, we'll show you, we'll be the experiment, we'll be the sick, dying cancer patient, but you've got to work with us, give us more time, and we'll show you how you can reform the whole monetary system for the Eurozone for the better good for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that, Sean. Uh, I think there are quite a lot of questions that uh, this exchange gives rise to, and we have, we have room for, for one more short question on this uh, topic. A short question with a short response, I should say. <laughs> so. Okay, no, no more questions about that? <laughs> okay, well, well thank, you. thank you very much. Um, uh, do any of the uh, presenters want to give a short response to, to anything more that you've been thinking about during this, uh, these two hours? Okay. Yes, I think I've... Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, then, then I will, uh, in, in conclusion, and then we are very well within our new after-lunch uh, schedule, I'd like to say that it's, uh, in concluding this inspiring session, or I felt that it was inspiring at least, that, it's, that, that we've seen very clearly from several different angles that it's fundamental change and not incremental improvements uh, that we need, whether we uh, discuss as we've done now very, very attentively how we could reform the economic system, how we could change uh, this, uh, this strange, uh, overly strong uh, influence that the financial markets have on the, on the rest of the societies, how to stimulate social entrepreneurship, integrate gender, uh, include labor and other stakeholders, in, in short, how to, how to promote uh, sustainable uh, business innovation. It's, it's clear to me, I think, at least, that we need, we need fundamental reform and we need a whole jigsaw puzzle of lots of pieces that need to come into place. It's not one, one uh, solution. Um, and in, in my concluding comment, I want to draw not only on the presentations that, uh, that have been made here today, uh, but also on, on uh, the broader research that's out there, including the research of the Sustainable Companies Project that, uh, that several of you have contributed to, this international research project that was uh, concluded last year and where we identified one very important dom dominant barrier to sustainable business that needs to be dismantled, and that's shareholder primacy. And the short-termism, the economic incentives that very misguidingly have been put into place that, uh, that support this uh, shareholder primacy, uh, the, the, the narrow focus that it encourages. The EU policymakers have, as Georgina touched upon, begun to realize that this is a problem, but they are miles away from understanding the reasons for the problem, the causes, uh, or how to, how to reform it. And that, that, that is our joint project, our joint mission, is to, from our different perspectives, to contribute to how, how to achieve the fundamental reform that, that we have. And since there are so many uh, uh, bright people here who are interested in these issues, I'd like to mention that the Sustainable Companies team, which is an international team of scholars that we didn't really want to just dismantle when the project uh, was over, has now been transformed into a network, a Sustainable Market Actors Network. And that is open to anybody who wishes to, to join there and it will be the basis for, for new projects. We're planning a new project on Sustainable Market Actors for Responsible Trade. And I look forward to, to continue discussing these issues with you. With you all, we'll have a, a short break now, try to keep it to 15 minutes instead of 20 minutes, and then we will actually have uh, not only kept within the schedule after lunch, but uh, saved a little bit of time so that we, we're not too tired when we get to the drinks reception. Okay, thank you very much.